So, hey everybody, my name is Paul Vocio. Uh, I work at Rackspace. I've been there uh, six years, uh, joined in 2007, and I worked on the SliceOS product just shortly after the integration. And I've been working on, uh, we started on open source Zen, and we transitioned to Zen server shortly after for uh, primarily the Windows support and a lot of the performance stuff. So, uh, what we're going to talk about is just kind of our internal infrastructure on how we kind of how we kind of build our and and run our public cloud. Uh, talk about how we deploy and some of the challenges that we have in, in doing this at scale, and kind of what what's coming and what we're expecting and, and some things we hope to see out of the Zen project. So, um, the way we deploy our, our our cloud is we actually have an internal cloud. We call it uh, iNova or internal or infrastructure. And this is uh, a bunch of ex internal OpenStack services that we offer to uh, systems and users inside our, our internal network. And so anyone, um, actually they authenticate with the Keystone uh, auth system, get the token and then present that and then it's, a, it's really just an OpenStack deployment. So we don't do all the kind of the public facing um, features that we get, but it's more vanilla, a vanilla OpenStack install. So, uh, you know, for all the same reasons that everyone wants to do this on the public cloud, we offer it to our internal customers. So, easy to spin up some down, load balancing, testing, uh, load, uh, spikes, stuff like that. Um, and we also actually do this to boot our public cloud. So, I'm going to kind of go into this and show how it works. So, we actually have this internal cloud. We boot all these services that become our public cloud. So, when you're talking to an API endpoint at Rackspace, you're actually talking to a VM that's running on Zen, which is controlled by OpenStack. So, I'll kind of show how we do that. Um, uh, and a lot of other reasons we want to do this. So we, how do we react to downed hosts? We can migrate services around. It's just all, all the same benefits. So we have what we call just kind of a seed environment. It's just a generic term. But what we do is we uh, take a, a Zen server and we boot a single VM on it and we install all the OpenStack services. So here's the API, the scheduler, uh, the kind of non-scalable things, the database, the queue, and then we kind of package this up into kind of a golden RPM. And we take that RPM and then we kind of shove that into a, uh, a Zen server. So we download that and boot it up. And this kind of one box and this one VM uh, becomes the way we interact with it. And what we do is that, that one VM actually then, uh, we install the compute using that same mechanism onto a bunch of other Zen servers. So each of those uh, Zen server hosts is running a VM that runs the OpenStack uh, Nova compute service that, that does the interaction. So that, that single box up top is kind of our seed host. Um, all the ones underneath that are running are now become part of the cluster. So this is kind of what we, when we bootstrap, we have a, you know, five to ten nodes to get us off the ground. And then from there, we actually start provisioning more hosts. So from here, we're act interacting with us just like an OpenStack cloud. And so my engineers and the, the admins and everyone who's building these just start provisioning services, uh, configuring Puppet, kind of doing everything you would for a normal uh, kind of web app deployment. From here, these actually become our, our kind of just generic, what we call units of capacity. A unit is what we kind of quantify as 256 megs of RAM. So this becomes our kind of our, our capacity to go boot things. And so we actually split this up. Uh, our, our iNova environment is shared by all our internal projects. So everyone that's kind of runs uh, an OpenStack or a public service or even a lot of internal dev and test services run in, in our iNO environment, which sits next to the same VMs that run our public cloud. So a public cloud API endpoint may be running next to someone's internal you know, test rig. So we use our public cloud like we do our, our internal cloud like people use our public cloud. So you have dev and test and kind of mixed everything up in, in the same environment. And we do our best to kind of do uh, performance isolation and segments. So if we see somebody swapping, we'll start moving stuff around like we, like we normally would on our public cloud. So those units of capacity become our, our total available capacity. And then from there, what we do, uh, I mentioned that we can kind of deploy our, our dev, pre-prod, and d test environment. So we actually start provisioning more of those API nodes, and, and this is what it ends up looking like. So this, this available capacity uh, box right here is what we, was, we would call iNova that no one ever sees except us. And then the uh, public actually talks to our production API endpoints down here. So that's just a little bit of, you know, at a, at a very high level on, on how we uh, manage and deploy this. And then, like I said, these become our dev uh, staging and production nodes. So, so it, one thing I, I learned at coming to Rackspace, and I, I kind of grew up in uh, the small startups where at scale, for me, coming out of a startup was a couple hundred machines. And, you know, I thought that, you know, when you manage a couple hundred machines with two or three guys, you know, we were being very efficient. We were doing things really well. Rackspace kind of changed my version of scale. And so when, when, we, when we came together and realized that we really wanted to build OpenStack and we really didn't want to do this again, you know, we kind of set our goal at, you know, uh, our internal goal is a million hypervisors. We want the system to, when you move forward and you really want to think about, I never wanted to design this again, 
how, what do we want to think about? So we set our kind of internal goal at a million. So as a global cloud, you know, we want to be able to manage hundreds of thousands of hypervisors. And so as we, we realize, you know, we have to break these down. So we break these down to the region um, and then our cell into an individual hypervisor. So we, we deploy things in chunks of, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of individual hypervisors, which kind of gave birth to the cell concept, which we'll, we can cover shortly here, but it's something that we kind of uh, had been running internally and then kind of brought it into the OpenStack community as a way to manage clusters of machines for whatever boundaries. So layer two uh, network boundaries is really what we've kind of designed ours around, but they could go as wide or as small as you want to. There's really no constraint on how big a cell is. So it's whatever your uh, people do it, can do it by cabinet or by hardware clash or whatever we chose layer two boundaries within our network. So our, our normal deploy and release strategy isn't that different than anyone else. So we pull trunk down, we kind of package it, we push it out uh, to a test environment, and then we iterate over that. The difference is we do this from trunk. So we don't wait till the major milestone releases or even the, the big six-month releases. We, we do this every day. And the, there's, there's a lot of challenges involved in that. And so I, I kind of equate this to the faster you want to get to the speed of light, the more energy you have to get to do there. So we have to devote a lot of engineering people and time and, and resources into keeping us from, uh, close to trunk. So we pull trunk down, we get all those new bugs and new things that people have fixed that go break us. And so when we pull these down, something that we thought was fixed or something was working is now broken. And now this uh, pushes our deploy window out uh, until this gets fixed or we have to decide is this a blocker or not for us to do this. But I think the advantages for this is we get features and we get fixes very early. And so we are usually a couple weeks behind trunk and that's how long it takes to kind of wash through our system. But I think the advantages that we've seen um, are uh, good for us and good for our customers. So but usually by the time we hit the summit, uh, and the code has been cut and released, we're usually already on it. We put a lot of effort in trying to get the most current release out. So we're going to do our best to be on the Ice House release when we hit the, the November summit. So when we talk about deploying, and, and we, again, we talked about scale, um, because a lot of the OpenStack components don't work well if they're out of sync, you can't run a compute on a forward version uh, and some of the stuff going forward and backward, we have to get everything else out as fast as possible. So what we kind of see is the number of deploys that we were able to do over, over our time period. And so we, we kind of hit a stopping point in, in uh, February of this year when our scale got too big and the time it took to deploy ran too long. So because, uh, and we use, we use Puppet, and we couldn't update the Puppet manifest, and it kind of lazily check in and update its package, which meant it's now out of sync with the messaging library that's using the RPC go to the far side. So it was kind of an all or nothing type upgrade. So what we ended up doing uh, was moving to a, uh, a vert, we were doing Debian vert packages. And so we realized one of the ways we could get around this is just by doing a small virtual environment. So we actually started shipping the libraries and the code and the puppet manifest all with it. So this kind of cut down on uh, some of our pre-stuff because what we actually do is uh, more like a fabric type deploy. So we'll push everything out and then just resim link it when it comes time to move. So we're actually moving packages at deploy time which saved us a ton of time. Um, and we actually use uh, BitTorrent to deliver a lot of these. So this was kind of a, a no-brainer when you go back and look at it, but at the time, you know, we'd built everything using PSSH and SCP and, and you know, kind of custom scripts to move everything around. Um, and the torrent actually cut it down by a number of hours. So we're actually able to pre-stage using torrents. Um, uh, this, an interesting challenge for us was also because of our, our, we have a fairly flat network and it goes very wide. And so what we ended up having to do was kind of segment this up. Uh, into multiple seed torrents coming out of uh, cloud files. So we're able to see, serve torrents out of cloud files, uh, push this across our clusters as long as you're not saturating firewalls. This works very, very, very well. Um, and again, we moved away from a centralized puppet master to a masterless puppet. Uh, because I said our updates had to happen very fast, um, when everything would check in over puppet, we're basically DDoSing these puppet masters. So we would have to scale these very wide for a very short amount of time, assuming it all worked. If it didn't, then you'd have to go back and kind of hot patch these certain particular ones that didn't check in. So moving to a masterless puppet uh, coupled with torrents, coupled with our uh, being able to push this ahead of time made these things go a lot easier for us. So how do we adapt for scale issues? So we, upstream OpenStack, what we're trying to do is work on um, more specific use cases on how we do this. So uh, more particular testing around Zen coverage and uh, rack space use cases um, and more production like dev environment. So, um, the 
dev stack environment is what's used to kind of gate a lot of the check-ins. And that's not necessarily, you know, sometimes the, the best way to gate how we check in. So we're looking to get more production type uh, loads either at scale. Um, and again, talking about uh, database and code manager. So something that works really well for 60, 60 lines in a database, 60 rows, doesn't work well for us when we have 60 million. So if you're tracking all your images or all your snapshots or all your VMs that have run, we ended up doing, having to do a lot of pruning. So something that ran very quickly when you checked it in through Garrett, will, uh, migration for us will take hours. And so we have, to, by staying up on trunk, we actually realize these are coming and then have to kind of mitigate it. What we really like to do is move that step one, one more thing, one more process upstream to where if you have large data sets, you run a migration, you know that it's gonna work or it's not ahead of time. And so we're not having to kind of scram on the backside and kind of struggle with once we've already had the code land. Um, and then we still want to stay close to trunk. I think that's, that's a big benefit to the community because we catch things, but hopefully before they go into production, sometimes they slip through, but by having uh, a large system uh, running trunk at the edge of what we do this, I think is, is very beneficial. So talked about some of these. So, you know, we get early detection of, of codes and issues. Um, and we actually is found it much easier to do small releases. So this is, you know, agile-ish in that we do this every couple weeks, um, but you know, by not waiting six months before releases, we're not getting these huge, you know, three-day never sleep deploys, which nobody really likes doing. So we try to do deploys in all our regions every couple weeks. We'll take our smallest DC, roll that one first, let it bake, if that one looks good, then we'll roll this across the others. What we'd really like to do, and I think some work is underway to do this, is upgrade our cells at a time. Because we have dozens of cells with tens of thousands of hypervisors, it really becomes difficult. It's going to get difficult for us to roll an entire region in, an, in a night. And what we'd like to do is be able to deploy small, small sets of machines throughout the night or have these roll through uh, to where they can handle different message formats or if a database migration is run, being able to take the data from one column and migrate it to the second one and on the next deploy, then you deprecate the first column and roll forward, but database migrations are really what holds us back from a lot of this. So some of the things where we'd really like to see this go, so um, IO scheduling uh, for some of the VHDs, I know this is uh, being able to detect swaps. And so uh, instances that are swapping affect uh, other tenants in a multi-tenant environment. And so when, when we first got on Zen Server, a lot of the, the multi-tenant protections that we see now really didn't exist. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we had to go bake into it is, is doing uh, MAC address spoofing and a lot of tenant isolation and a lot of things that uh, it, I, I think the product was built for mostly use in a particular, let's say, corporate environment where you semi-trust each other and you had a single administrator doing this. And that makes sense, but when you, when you kind of give it to the public and tell them to go knock themselves out, they start doing really stupid stuff that you never thought they would do. And so we had to buckle this down really hard. And so one of the things that um, causes a lot of users a lot of grief is someone's, someone would buy the smallest instance possible and really try to squeeze the most performance out of this. And what you would see is that disk would start swapping really badly because we haven't allocated a lot of CPU or a lot of RAM to them. And so that swapping would therefore affect other users on that same box, which is having to take up CPU time and, and IO time. And so being able to isolate those tenants on, on a disk partition uh, level would be really key for us. Um, and getting better VM resource usage. So I know that there's some RD graphs kind of baked in under the hood down in Zen server, and we've, we'd get very kind of weird results from it. Sometimes we'd pull for bandwidth, and we'd, we'd be doing, you know, a couple megs a minute, and it would spike two gigabits and then spike back down. And we, because we were testing, we knew we had never sent this. So we ended up having to kind of reinvent our own kind of metering and, and um, uh, uh, billing around that. So that was, that was kind of a hard point for us. And so um, just a little better kind of monitoring and introspection on what's going down, you know, kind of under the hood would, would be good for us. Um, Zappy calls uh, into Zen Store, which has been a big one for us. So, you know, we, I think uh, Katabir was talking about, you know, people SSHing in and XMing or XE or XL commands. Yeah, that was us. You know, we, we did a lot of that just because some of those commands aren't available over, um, over Zappy. So we would kind of look at the documentation and realize you can do some stuff on, on XM, but you can't do it on Zappy. And so you end up having to kind of split our, our API call. Some we would do over Zappy, which we wanted to for the session persistence, but some would have to fall back to SSH, come in and twiddle something and come out. So we ended up having this kind of fractured library, which was kind of a mess to maintain. Um, and the upgrade experience has, has been a bad one for us. So we've, we're running probably, a, I don't know, half a dozen different Zen server versions from 5.5 all the way up to 6.2. And I think 6.2 is the one where we finally get the uh, live migration. So we're very, very excited about that. Uh, just for the idea that we'll be able to distribute a lot of um, 
you know, we see a, a hot tenant or someone doing a lot of load, we can move them, isolate them onto their own box or, or up upgrade them where they don't notice. And so uh, with this coming out, we've got some new DCs rolling out. We're looking uh, forward to making use of this feature and kind of experimenting with it and see how it works, seeing how much it will improve the experience uh, for the customer and that we're able to move them around or give them um, better isolation or better experience and they won't know that they're being moved. Uh, VDI introduction for new VMs. So this was um, something that we noticed instead of having to do an SR scan, we can just tell it, hey, it's there. Um, and I think, see, incremental backups we talked about. Um, and I think some of the stuff uh, either, so we're on uh, Zen Server 6.2. Uh, we've kind of been experimenting with going to or towards just a, a, a OS and taking the packaging from, from the Zen project and building on top of that. And so we've been working with these guys and, and some of the guys over in Cambridge on how this, and we're very interested in how this is going to work. Um, something we've been trying to work with for a while, but uh, it seems now with the foundation coming out, we're, we're finally at a good time to move forward. This kind of in the open instead of trying to figure out how to do this just by ourselves. Um, and I think we've been working with them as well on trying to virtualize the whole OpenStack experience to make this work better well. So we've been working with OpenStack guys and with the Citrix guys on uh, how we can virtualize this and move the sword. So push the testing from inside the walls of specific companies actually out to the open to where use cases that uh, we see in the real world using this under heavy load get tested before they, they kind of slip in downstream. So um, that's all I had. Anybody have any questions? I just want to thank you for your time. Anyone with questions? Well, thank you, Paul. Sweet.